It might make us feel better to say, I'm going to wear Patagonia instead of some polyester shirt. Okay, please do. Please do. But you haven't helped change the system. And that's what we need to do. We need to change the system. Magnesium Breakthrough is my favorite magnesium supplement. Click the link in the description to save 10%. Seth, you wrote a book about climate change. We're going to talk about carbon, its impact, and the whole picture. But before we get into it, what do you say to the people out there who are in denial that climate change is even a thing? You don't want to hear what I have to say. I'm not going to waste your time. I mean, there, there, there are people, there are people who think, not you personally, there are people who think the moon is made out of green cheese. There are people who think the world is flat. These are people who are intentionally not paying attention. I don't have time to argue with them. That's not going to solve our problem. Our problem is going to be solved by systemic action taken by people who are aware of science and of how we can make a difference. And there are more than enough people in that category to make things better. And it's a trap to start having what looks like a discussion with someone who just wants to have an argument. And that's why I think it's important we open up with that and go over it because a lot of people, when they learn about, or if they already know what we're going to be talking about today and they start to bring it to friends and family, when they, when they go against that resistance, maybe it is better off just to let it go and, and to redirect that energy to the right people. That's right. I mean, okay, so first, I didn't write the book. I coordinated the work of 300 volunteers in 40 countries. And every single fact on the 97,000 words of the Almanac isn't made up by us. Everything is footnoted. There's more than a thousand things you can look up. And the entire thesis of the book is don't take our word for it. You can look it up. And in order to feel confident enough to have the conversation we need to have, People need to know that they could look it up. They don't have to look it up, but they need to know that they could. Because we cannot solve this by not using plastic bags when we go to the grocery store. We cannot solve this by composting. That was invented by British Petroleum to trick us into thinking this is an individual problem. It's not an individual problem. It's a systemic problem. And the only way to solve a systemic problem is with systemic solutions. And so if you write 10 letters or 15 letters or make five phone calls or organize some people in your community, you will be amazed at what an impact you can have. Well, let's get more into the nuances of this because a lot of people do feel like they're making a big impact by using those re -sho reusable shopping bags and, and doing things like composting, recycling. You know, you might have just deflated a lot of people who feel like they're on the right path. So let's talk more about the nuances of what that do does look like as an individual, because there are things, it's not just, you know, reach out and share the message. There's things we need to do at a, at a level within the home and within our life. And then, like you said, it's also reaching out and connecting with a bigger audience and spreading this message. So let's, let's get into both of those separately. Let's get into sure. what really matters on an individual level. What are the big needle movers that people can apply to start having a real impact in their day-to-day -day life on their carbon emissions. Okay, so let, let me go back a couple steps because the people who are still listening are people who are curious and people who want to understand. If you take a deep breath right now, 10,000 molecules are going to go into your body. And of those 10,000 molecules, four of them are carbon, four out of 10,000. For the last 100,000 years, it was three out of 10,000. Now it's four. If it gets up to five out of 10,000, the entire world changes forever. The ice caps are melted, entire countries, Miami, underwater. That's the difference. We're talking about little, 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 tiny amounts that make a huge difference. And so the question that you could then ask is, well, where's all this carbon coming from? And the answer is, for 100 years, oil and gas have been way too cheap. They have fueled a, a massive industrial profit uh, bonanza that has made every person who's listening to this richer than they would have been. The thing is that they're going to make a trillion plastic bags this year, a trillion. The thing is that uh, one coal plant burning coal to make power, whether it's in your neighborhood or anyone else's neighborhood, because we're all on the same planet, 
overwhelms what any single human being can do. There are systemic things we can lead to. For example, if you are first in line to support a company that is trying something like, I don't know, an inexpensive electric car, you will be rewarding them in a way that will get them to do it more. That our individual actions are useful in the sense that they send a message to the people who run systems. But if I look at how much carbon I made and how much carbon you made, one person scolding a clerk at the supermarket, all she's doing is making herself upset. The woman in front of me at the supermarket yesterday, she was 80 years old. She was buying five things and she was really upset that the reusable bags that they sell at the supermarket are not compostable. And she's correct that the plastic bags that we're using, the heavier ones, are going to end up in a landfill. But she was buying watermelon that was wrapped in plastic. Now, the last time I checked the watermelon, it already had a wrapper on it. And it doesn't need to be wrapped in plastic. So the question is, how do we get all the supermarkets to stop wrapping grapefruit and watermelon in plastic? Because in the amount of effort it takes you to not do one little thing, you could organize people to get all the supermarkets in America to stop using plastic to wrap their vegetables. That's the systemic things that we're talking about. That as soon as businesses hear that people actually care about this, 20 letters, 40 letters, 100 letters on a brand manager's desk or CEO's desk changes everything. So what I'm hearing you say is that a lot of people have good intentions and they're trying to make good decisions in their own life, but that energy is often misplaced and not having as great of an impact as it could have if they redirected it. And that's why we're here today, to help people know where to put that energy because we are all busy. There is so much conflicting information when it comes to this climate change thing, which I want to talk about. And it's people need to know with their limited resource of time and, and money how to best use that. Correct. Now, you know, your podcast does a great job of talking about placebos, and I love placebos. I think placebos are underrated. They have no side effects, they don't cost very much, and they make people better. The story we tell ourselves is really really important. And a lot of people who are dealing with anxiety about the climate problem would like to tell themselves the story that they're doing everything that they can, that they are you know, changing the thermostat or uh, carpooling to work. And I'm not telling you not to do that. I haven't been on an airplane in two years, and I don't intend to get on one anytime soon. But we are all hypocrites. And if you're a hypocrite, that doesn't mean you don't speak up it means you especially have to speak up. And that the way to find solace, the way to find a way forward is to become an organizer, is to raise your hand and to coordinate action. Because it's unbelievable how much power you have to change structures. And I'll give you one more example and then I'll let you talk. Um, leaf blowers, a, a leaf blower, and there were no leaf blowers in the United States 40 years ago. Leaf blowers, one leaf blower, for one hour, emits as much carbon as a car driving from New York to Los Angeles and back in one hour. And they make electric leaf blowers that don't do that. So leaf blowers should be against the law. And until they're against the law, then gardeners who are trying to hustle to cut corners are going to keep using them. And you could say to your gardener, as we did five years ago, stop using gas leaf blowers. And we had to pay them extra to do that. But then as soon as he crossed the street to the neighbor next door, he whapped them up again. But now in my town, it's against the law to use leaf blowers. And the gardeners who have switched are glad they did because they're lighter and easier and require less maintenance. And it's quieter for everybody. So it only took 40 people to make leaf blowers against the law in my town. That's the kind of argument we need to start making. And why conversations like this are so important, multiple reasons, but one of them is letting people know about things like leaf blowers. So when they organize with that committee of people, they know where to focus that energy. It's not just exactly. about the one person not getting a leaf blower, or just saying, you know, I'm switching to electric. It's like, we need to know where the problems are. And then we need to act as a cohesive unit, like you did in your town, and, and, and go for the, the attack on that as a group. 
Correct. And that's what the almanac is. It's hundreds of pages of clever facts and cartoons and charts and graphs. And you can look at it and say, you know what's controversial? What's controversial is no one can predict the future. But it is not controversial that the ice caps are melting. And it is not controversial that they're going to make a trillion bags next year. And it is not controversial that it went over 100 degrees Fahrenheit in Siberia last year. That is not controversial. That's just the weather. So do people generally have it right when they know what areas that they should be attacking, whether it be plastic bags or whatever it is? Like we have these general ideas, like we should be driving electric cars and all these stereotypes. So I think two parts of this conversation so we can really help people the most is to mm -hmm. let people know where they're going to have the greatest impact. And then two, let's get into the minutia and let's do that later of how somebody can go about forming a group and then doing that in an effective way where they're actually going to impact some change. Okay. Well, I will tell you more than half of all the carbon that's being emitted comes from four things. So if you just want to understand where the boat is leaking, it's four things. It is concrete, which blew me away. I didn't think concrete was a problem. It's cows which is a much bigger problem than almost anyone imagines. In the United States, we spent $50 billion last year subsidizing the beef industry, $50 billion. And half of all the land in the continental United States is used to graze cattle. And as people around the world get richer, they're switching to beef. And if everyone in the world ate beef the way we eat in the United States, we would need a whole other planet just for the cows. So that's number two. Number three is coal, because coal is just straight up. It's like sniffing cocaine. It's just straight into the system. And the last one is combustion. All the places that we burn fossil fuel to come out of the ground in addition to coal. Those four things are the big ones. And what we know is we were able to pave the whole earth without anyone being in charge. We were able to give almost half the people on earth a smartphone without anyone being in charge. The market is really smart. Capitalism is really powerful. And the way we're going to solve this problem is by pricing carbon fairly. If you are paying the accurate price for the carbon you are using, you will make different decisions. You will see two pieces of fruit, one wrapped in plastic, one not, and the one wrapped in plastic will cost twice as much. You will see two funnels for sale at the uh, auto supply store. One is metal, one is plastic. The plastic one will cost three times as much. Right now, the plastic one is cheaper. It shouldn't be cheaper because everyone who didn't buy that funnel is paying for it. They're paying for it because everything around them is going to die as a result of someone saving $2 on a plastic funnel. So you talked about the four factors there. What one, as an individual can we really get behind and have the biggest impact? Again, as a group, but somebody listening sure. in that says, I'm going to be that leader to, to create some change. There's probably one or two of those that they're going to have the greatest impact. And what would those be? I think that the easiest thing to do is to change societal norms about where we expect to be served beef and how much beef we expect to be served. That I'm not sitting here saying everyone should be a vegan. What I'm saying is, how many days a week is no meat day at your high school cafeteria? Because if it's like most cafeterias, the answer is zero. Or what is the typical serving of beef at a restaurant? Because it's twice as big as it was 20 years ago. And if we think about speaking up at restaurants, at school board meetings, when planning a wedding, if we just make it less normal the way we did with cigarettes, less normal for there to be beef everywhere, then we can scale that back really fast and it won't cost people very much at all. And when it comes to beef, I'm glad you brought this up in the book. You talked about regenerative agriculture. So there's the way, you know, CAFO farms, the way beef has been traditionally done. And then there's these new farmers that are coming, maybe not even new, but there's a new movement, at least talking about it, this regenerative farming. So my question for you is, is the answer regenerative farming or is it getting away from beef altogether? So I know some regenerative farmers, and there is no question that we have depleted the soil. The soil, which covers most of the earth, captures an enormous amount of carbon. It's right under your feet. 
And if we farm in factory ways, what we're doing is killing the soil and it can no longer hold on to the carbon. However, and it's a huge, huge however, there are 7 billion people on the planet and we can't even come close to feeding them meat using regenerative farming. That regenerative farming feels like it harkens back to the 1700s and it probably does, but it also doesn't yield the way per acre, the way that factory farming does. That's why they switched. And so I am in favor of intensive regenerative farming that captures carbon for the soil, growing vegetables. But all the data that I have seen says, except for some people who can take the time and the enormous amount of money it will take to raise beef that way, it is not a scalable solution. I would also point out to people who are concerned about their health that eating large quantities of beef has only happened in my lifetime. That is not a traditional way for human beings to sustain themselves. Let's go back a step here and talk about carbon and what it's doing. Because we've all heard about climate change. We've heard about, you know, carbon, carbon dioxide, greenhouse gases. But let's put the full picture together so people understand when they're making these choices that aren't good, that aren't good at all for the environment, what is happening? Okay. So we talk about greenhouse gases, but a lot of people don't understand what that is. I wasn't sure until I learned. Uh, 2,000 years ago, an emperor in Greece wanted to eat cucumbers in the winter. And they had to invent the greenhouse to enable him to do that. And the way a greenhouse works is it's panels of glass that allow sunlight through but keep the heat in. And every day, the earth gets heated by the sun. And if we didn't have any air at all, we would die immediately because we couldn't breathe. But also, the earth would be really, really cold. And when the sunlight comes in, if there's stuff in the air, if the air isn't 100% pure, which it never is that stuff in the air captures some of the heat and holds on to the infrared as opposed to letting it bounce back into space. Some of it's water vapor. But what we have changed is not the water vapor. What we have changed is added many, many billions of tiny particles of carbon dioxide. And so you can't see it most of the time. But if you saw black smoke coming out of every electrical appliance you own and every car you drive and all the concrete you use, you would stop immediately because you see black smoke and you say, this must be really poisonous. So what's happening is as we put this carbon dioxide into the air, the earth is heating. And if it heated just a little, that would just be weather. But it, if it consistently and persistently does this, some cycles erupt. And one of the cycles is the ice caps are melting and we can see that. You don't have to guess. You can see that the ice caps are melting. When they melt, they go into the ocean. When the ocean gets that new water in it, a whole bunch of things change. In some places, the ocean gets colder because it's got ice melting in it. Some places it gets warmer. It shifts the direction that the tides flow. And the ocean can then can't capture all the carbon it used to. And it all keeps cascading. And that leads to sea level rise. And most people who are listening to this either live near the sea or know someone who does. And if we look at a city like Miami or New York, near where I live, they're just a couple feet above sea level. So if the sea rises a little bit and there's any storm whatsoever, they're underwater. In addition, it fuels things like droughts and hurricanes and other things. So when you add it all up, we're going to have to fight the weather. Fighting the weather is a losing game. We have never been good at fighting the weather. It's really expensive to fight the weather. And so each individual isn't wrecking the planet. But the system is, because the system's job is to burn carbon to make a profit. You said a couple of things there I want to highlight. One is that we don't see the carbon coming off when we're using appliances and doing things. And that's a big problem because we don't see that, that immediate effect of what we're doing. Two is that it's it's a group thing. I think you mentioned this, the fact that it's not one individual. So it's we have this diffusion of responsibility because we're all part of it. And three, it's happening over such a long period of time. It's not happening, you know, I, I 
use this car and this leaf blower. And then tomorrow there's these changes I'm seeing. It's happening, happening over hundreds of years, even though you make a good point in the book that this is all speeding up and happening much more quickly lately. It's still a relatively long period of time. So that's why it's so important to get the education out because we can see because of these factors why it has become such a problem. But, and I'm sorry it took me 20 minutes to get to this, it's also a massive opportunity. It's a massive opportunity, first of all, to live in a resilient world where the air is cleaner and we are healthier. It is a massive opportunity to have factories and systems that get free power whenever they need it. It's a massive opportunity for entrepreneurs to make a profit. It's a massive opportunity for us to rewire systems of privilege so that people who have traditionally been left out because of where they were born now have a chance to produce things of value. And so we've faced situations before as a community, as a planet. And when we look at them as opportunities, people figure out what to do and where we started with, what should I say to the deniers? Well, there were people who denied that the internet was going to be useful too. And I just didn't listen to them and I built an internet company. So look at what's happening and say, do I want to do something about this and benefit me and the people I care about? Because you can. So what you're saying is it's not too late. It's not too late. It's We have to hurry. In 10 years, if we don't, it will be too late. In 10 years, we should just have a big dirge and give up. But over the next 10 years, we have the chance to say, we keep pissing in the river. And it turns out the river goes in a circle and we live downstream. And the thing is, nobody complains about speed limits in a school zone because kids aren't supposed to have to take care of themselves. And if you get in an accident, that's horrible. And nobody complains about rules about dumping sewage in the river because we know that there's someone downstream. It might be us. And this is just like that. What we have made the mistake of doing for a hundred and so years is dumping stuff in the river. And one of the things that we include in the Almanac is a Xerox of a two-page memo that a scientist at Exxon wrote in 1982. And in 1982, sentence by sentence, he described exactly what is happening to the degree he got it all right. And then Exxon said, wait a minute, we won't make a profit in the short run if people know this. And so they hid the memo. And what the purpose of the almanac is, is to say, look, it's all here. Just look it up. Make your own decisions. You talked about this 10-year period, this window that we still have. Are you hopeful that we're going to be able to make the change given the history of humanity and where you see this all going? So if we look at what the world was like in 1910, you really couldn't walk across the street of any city because it was covered with horse poop. And if we look at the world of 1920, you really couldn't cross the street because you were going to get run over by a car. And the thing is, the world we live in now, for most people, most of the time, is safer and better off than humans have ever been. We have the ability, because of our system, to be resilient. Now, we also have a media system right now that is celebrating the worst trolls among us, that is making heroes out of people who are just picking fights. And that doesn't give me any optimism at all. But when I see the hundreds, now thousands of people who are working with me on this project, and we're all volunteers, including me, and I see what people are capable of, yeah, I'm optimistic. I would say one of the greatest challenges is going to be the fact that our economy is based on the way the system is currently running. There's so many jobs involved with the the way the infrastructure is set now. How do we go about pivoting? You know, there's there's these factories and all kinds of people involved and and so much money. And how do we begin to turn that ship when it's when it goes so deep? Well, how many full time coal miners do you think there are in the United States? I don't know. Uh almost none. A hundred thousand. Okay. That when uh, Kayak and and TripAdvisor and Travelocity came along and put every single travel agent out of business. We figured it out, and the travel agents found something else to do. There will be disruptions. There's no question about it. My friend runs a gas station down the street, and it's not going to be easy for Tom when every car is electric. He'll find something because the alternative is we'll just all lose. And our economy 
is based on Schumpeter's idea of creative destruction, that most of us have jobs that did not exist 20 years ago. Think about that, that what you do for a living, what I do for a living, almost none of us could have had these jobs 30, 40 years ago. And so we're going to invent a whole new class of jobs and a whole new way for people to make value happen that will be cleaner and quieter and more resilient and in many ways more fun. And yeah, I get the fact that if I run an oil company and I have a trillion dollars underground, I might lie and deceive in order to make more money. But I hope not. Because the people who are running these giant companies, they got plenty of money. This is their chance. And if you look now what the biggest companies in the world are doing, they're all lining up and saying, yeah, it's no fun to win the game if the game is over and we have to play a new game. And through the research you and your team have done putting this book together, is there any solutions, again, when when there's companies that have this infrastructure and these big businesses and and there's actually physical you know, vehicles and plants are there ideas out there to how, how to help them and, and smooth this fall that's going to inevitably happen? Yeah, well, so there is a very straightforward systemic solution, and it is this. Um, give every single person in the United States, because that's my expertise, but around the world, give every person in the United States a check for $2,000 a year and get the money for that check by pricing carbon fairly. So if you keep buying what you were buying and doing what you were doing, you'll break even. You'll get the money back. You'll spend the money. Some people will say, whoa, whoa, this is great. They will use less carbon and they'll get the money. And some people will say, I'm so rich, I don't care. And they'll get on a private plane and it will cost them a lot more than it used to. And if we did that, that simple thing, in boardrooms around the world, people would take out their calculators and say, oh, we're going to do better if we don't shrink wrap that watermelon in plastic because plastic's not so cheap anymore. And we're going to do better if we take the train instead of flying 100 miles. And, we're, you know, there are all these ways we can do better if carbon is priced fairly because we will make different decisions about what to do about it. And when lots of us in sync make different decisions, the whole world changes. And that's a simple thing that could get done in just a few days. And there are countries where it is already happening. Um, there's at least one country that is already carbon negative, that puts more carbon back than it uses. And so this is possible. We are seeing this happen. And the people, particularly Russian oligarchs who own giant, giant oil mines, oil fields, they're not going to do so great. And if you own a coal mine, you've had plenty of warning. You're not going to do so great. But the fact is, if I was a coal miner, I would rather be an installer of solar panels than a coal miner anyway, because I would like to see my grandchildren grow up. And coal mining is a really dangerous way to make a living. So coming back to the earlier part of our conversation, talking about leaders stepping up, organizing groups of people to help make the change and not trying to do it solo. Let's get into the details of that and what that could look like. Somebody who says, OK, I'm ready. This is really resonating with me. How do I begin to rally the troops and organize that in a fashion that's going to be effective? Well, so here's a really simple example. No matter where somebody is in the world, if someone's running for parliament, if someone's running for lieutenant governor, if someone's running for dog catcher, there are certain things they have to answer questions about. And there are certain policies they have to say they're in favor of or against. And if every single time they open their mail and every single time they have a press conference, someone asks them about this, they're going to start taking a position. And right now, it's not even on most politicians' agenda because right now everyone's raising their hand and say, tell me about inflation or tell me about this public, you know, uh, local event that just happened. And it's not that hard to write a letter. It's not that hard to organize seven people to have a book group. It's not that hard to figure out how to say to the library, let's put these books on display. It's not that hard to ask these questions. No one's asking you to spend a lot of time. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You just have to make this the thing that you talk about. Because one of the beauty th beautiful things about market-driven capitalism is that markets are brilliant listening devices. That when the 
people speak, the market listens. And there are all these products that they used to sell, like cod liver oil, that they don't sell anymore. Be- not because people felt bad for the cod, but because they just didn't buy cod liver oil anymore. So they don't sell it. And what I have learned from this, because the almanac doesn't argue for any of this. It just lays it all out. But what I have learned from all of this is a surprisingly small number of people can change the course of an entire country. And because this is such a pressing problem that involves each and every one of us, and you know we have such limited time, and, and again, coming back to the 10 years, we need to act. Why do you think there are so many people that have a conflicting point of view? Is it, is it these oil companies that are trickling misinformation down? What, what's at the root of that? Why can't we all get on the same page? Uh, so there's a couple of factors, and this is something that is my area of expertise. Um, one of them is that we don't like to talk about death around here. And there's a reason that the mortician is not the most popular person at the cocktail party and why most people have not planned their funeral, because we would rather just pretend it doesn't exist. That's number one. Number two, the carbon footprint is one of the greatest marketing inventions of all time. The carbon footprint was brilliant. British Petroleum hired Ogilvy and May, their advertising agency in 1982, to come up with a way to get people to stop complaining by making it their fault. And the kind of person that was likely to be an environmentalist took them really seriously and said, yeah, I, I need to do less. And it became part of who we are as the kinds of folks who don't want to waste, who want to clean, clean up after ourselves, who rake our lawn. Like, I got to worry about my carbon footprint. And when I talk to people about the carbon footprint, I can see in their eyes that it is very unsettling to them when I say only 6% of all the plastic is recycled. That when you are putting that plastic in the recycling bin, they're just going to burn it. And people don't want to hear that because they would like to feel like this placebo is going to make them feel better. And I am sorry. I'm sorry that that isn't true, but it's not true. And so until we fix it, Using your time that you're spending on the environment, doing things like recycling plastic is a trap. It was invented by the plastics industry, so you would buy more plastic. Stop doing that. Instead, start making the plastics industry clean up their act. Let's talk more about that piece of detail there, because I'm sure that's going to be mind-blowing for a lot of people. We put our plastic in the recycle bin. We, we bring it to the end of the road. We say goodbye and then we go and fill it up again the next week. And we assume that every single piece of plastic and, and cardboard and everything that goes in there is going to be reused and, and, and we're not contributing to this problem. But I think this is important because we need to go take another step back and, and go upstream on the problem. And, and people need to be educated about what is really happening to know to do that. Correct. So there, there's a law of physics, which is that it's really hard to recycle plastic to begin with because the molecules wear out. So most kinds of plastic can't be recycled, or even if they could, you have to sort them so carefully because you can only do one kind of plastic at a time. The second thing is that the people who run these systems generally need to make money. And the most profitable thing for them to do is burn it. And if they have a big basket of plastic, they know how to burn it. They know how to incinerate it, turn it into heat, turn it into power, and sell it back to the grid. And so they do. And there are special cases where you can recycle plastic. But in general, glass is 40 times more recyclable than plastic. Glass can be used over and over again. We can just rinse it out and use it again, or we can break it into little pieces, melt it, and use it again. But it costs a little bit more to start with glass than it does to start with plastic. That's why a trillion plastic bags got made last year, because they're not expensive to make. But after you make them, you either got to burn them or throw them in the ocean. And we tend to do both. Let's talk about the energy piece. In North America here, let's talk about what we're currently doing for electricity. And then what are some alternatives? We know there's a couple that kind of take front and center with wind and, and solar. Are they really that much better? Okay, so here's really good news to start. Wind and solar in many places are now cheaper than oil and gas. And so given that it's cheaper, it's really hard to argue against it. Some people say, but it doesn't work at night. And the answer is, well, but batteries are getting a lot better. 
And what we know from the computer world is that when we start to do something more, we get better at it. And as we continue to explore batteries and solar and wind, we're getting better at it. That we've had 150 years to figure out oil, and we've only been spending 20 years on wind and solar. And they're already cheaper. But the other thing about the electrical grid is it's not magic. Getting electricity from the power plant to you is particularly complicated. And what happened in Texas last year didn't happen because of wind and solar. It happened because their grid is outmoded and doesn't connect to any of the other grids around the country. But the magic of solar and wind, particularly for the kind of people who are listening to this podcast, is you can use them off the grid, which means that we have a grid, fantastic, but you don't have to depend on it. That you can have your own power grid where you are for you and your neighbors. And this gives us more resilience. And in places, I I work with Acumen, which is a nonprofit that works around the world, in places like India, where they can build off-grid power, it's a complete game changer because there's no electricity in that little village outside of Borelli I visited, which means that at six o'clock at night, it's pitch black until six o'clock in the morning. You can't even see the hand in front of your face. You install some solar panels and batteries there. You install a wind turbine there. And now the people in that village can read, they can do their homework, they can have a sewing machine, they can do all sorts of things that we take for granted. And the fact is, a billion people around this planet, one out of seven, don't have any electricity at all. And they're going to get some. The question is, should they get it by hooking up to a coal plant, or should they get it by building resilient, off-grid, clean systems? And since this has been such a topic of conversation, again, conflicting information, but people have been talking about climate change. Are we moving, at least in North America, from coal to things like solar and wind? Is it just happening too slowly or is it being ignored? It is happening too slowly, but it is definitely happening. That most of the coal plants that are getting built are not getting built in North America. But Canada is the fourth biggest producer of fossil fuels in the world. And they're not moving away from that fast enough. And we're not shutting our coal plants fast enough. The people who run electricity generation do it for a living. And we need to create the conditions where they will make more money by building a solar farm than they will by fixing an old coal plant. Seth, earlier you talked about not flying for a couple of years. And I know we're coming up on the end of a pandemic here. It seems like we're working our way out of the tail end of it. So I'm sure that's a piece of it. but. In working on this book, what other big changes like that have you made from what you've learned? Yeah, so I gave a thousand speeches around the world throughout my career. I've been everywhere and I'm done. I'm just not doing it. It has nothing to do anymore with the pandemic. I'm turning down gigs on a regular basis because here I am talking to Jesse. I don't even know where you are and we're having a fine conversation. I don't need to get on an airplane to do my work. Um, My biggest shift is as someone who's been a vegetarian for 30 years, I am not focused on my footprint. I, my footprint is already 50, a hundred times bigger than the footprint of somebody in Kenya. I'm not focused on that. I can't get down to that level. I just can't. I am focused on community connection. I am focused on the idea that we don't need very many of us to work in sync to make a difference. So I'm spending my time encouraging the kinds of companies that are doing things that are going to change our system, encouraging people like you who are seeking to spread the idea. I've worked full-time on this project and I'm going to keep working full-time on it for free because it's the highest leverage way I can think of to cause a conversation to happen. And if we don't have the conversation, how on earth are we going to make things better? And I'm curious, how did you, Seth Godin, get your foot in the door on this? Because this is a little bit of a stray from, you know, your previous books and your previous work. When I saw what we were going to be getting into, how how did you get involved in this? So 16 years ago, I wrote my first post about climate change on my blog. And apparently it wasn't enough to solve the problem. Go figure. And so I watched sort of aghast at how we kept going backwards. And um, then I read a novel a year ago called Ministry for the Future that is stunning. Um, And I said, I got to do something. What's the highest leverage thing I can do? And before I wrote books about marketing and indoctrination and leadership, I wrote almanacs. 
And I said, how do I put those together? How do I expose the marketing story here? How do I expose how we've been brainwashed in the form of an almanac? And how do I do it the way I want everything to get fixed in community? So this isn't Seth Godin sat down and wrote some stuff. This is more than 300 people working together sat down and did some research and pointed you to the research. Look it up. And if you don't have time to look it up, don't get in the way of people who are trying to make things better. And for people like you who are in the know, this is arguably the best use of your time. Because again, comes back to that 10 years, we don't make the change then none of us are going to be around to do anything. Yes, exactly right. And when people like you show up and, and stretch the boundaries of what you talk about and what you stand for and how to bring an idea to the next person, that's all we need. Think about how much the world has changed since 1960 when I was born, when we had the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Berlin Blockade, and then we had um, the Vietnam War, and then we had the war on smoking, and just go down the list. We have changed this world over and over again, and we can change it this time, but it helps to see what's going on. In closing here, we've really hammered home the fact that this isn't an individual fight. We need to, to diversify and, and coordinate with other people. But for people like me and you who, you know, we live a and think a little bit differently, we want to be able to make those changes at home still because, you know, every, every little bit counts. Let's talk about, because there, again, there's so many things that people are doing. We talked about recycling, but there's composting, electric cars. What are people doing at home that is actually helpful? And what are we just wasting our time with? I know that I've avoided answering this question three times because I am afraid that if I describe to people something they can do in their home where every little bit helps, they will feel better. And that's a trap. And I would not be doing you a service if I said feeling a little bit better is going to help. What is going to help is to change the system. I've seen the math. We share the math. It is way more out of whack than you know. Imagine being on a boat and there's a hole in the boat that's three feet wide. And in your cabin, there's a hole that's a pinprick. You could sit in your cabin and put your finger over the hole, but there's still going to be a hole that's three feet wide on the other side of the boat. We have to figure out how to get the word out that we need big equipment to come and fix the big hole. Because it might make us feel better to say, I'm going to wear Patagonia instead of some polyester shirt. Okay, please do. Please do. But you haven't helped change the system. And that's what we need to do. We need to change the system. Well, I think it was helpful that I continued to prod you, continued to resist, to emphasize the importance of this, this thesis of our whole conversation, the fact that it takes an army. So we'll leave it at that. Seth, I'm going to link the book up, your social media. Really enjoyed the conversation. This book is so important, so timely, and I'm excited to help get the word out. Thank you, sir. A real pleasure. Keep making a ruckus. Your leadership really matters. Thank you. Now that you're finished with my conversation with Seth, the perfect follow-up is my chat with Alicia. We talk about living clean and sustainably. And here we are with about 10 more years to, to, to turn this thing around. And when will we all collectively decide that the air that we breathe matters?